The internet has been exploding with grim headlines this month, such as Mars Cornice will die after 68 days. This all traces back to the publication of a paper by a group of PhD students at MIT, but the media has completely misunderstood the paper's conclusions. To clear up any confusion, I am going to examine the paper's findings, which do not, in fact, predict any loss of life. The most important thing to note about the MIT study is that the widely reported 68 days to first fatality comes from an initial simulation run without any local resource production taken into account. The way their simulation works is that it calculates how long it takes for each of the supply tanks to run out when they aren't being replenished, and then it uses that in subsequent runs to inform how much of each resource needs to be produced locally on Mars. The technical term for this is in situ resource utilization, and these systems are intentionally neglected in the first run of the simulation in order to work out how big the systems actually have to be. Now, in previous videos, I've talked about how Mars One collects water from the Martian regolith, breaks it down into oxygen via electrolysis, and then combines it with nitrogen and argon from the Martian atmosphere in order to create the breathable air. When these systems are taken into account, the study finds that no fatalities occur, and I'll get to that more later. So where does this infamous 68 days figure come from? Firstly, the research is selected for a mixture of nine different food types for the cornice. Dry bean, lettuce, peanut, rice, soybean, sweet potato, tomato, white potato, and wheat. These were the only foods considered, as they based all of their crop growth predictions on an existing NASA model that is limited to just those nine foods. So insects and how they would consume oxygen isn't taken into account, for example. The problems really begin on day 62 of the simulation, when the first wheat crop begins to mature and produce an excess supply of oxygen. This raises the oxygen percentage inside of the habitat, to which the control system responds by venting some of the air and then replenishing it with pure nitrogen. Since the air vented was around 70% nitrogen, and the nitrogen from the storage tanks is 100% nitrogen by definition, the net effect is to lower the oxygen percentage back to the 26% target. But the problem is that this rapidly depletes the nitrogen tanks until eventually they run out entirely on day 66 of the simulation. After that, the oxygen percentage continues to rise uncontrollably, and due to leakage of the atmosphere inside of the habitat to the exterior Martian environment, it causes the pressure to also decrease. Eventually, it reaches the point where the pressure gradient is no longer sufficient for oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream inside of our lungs, and this leads to the somewhat counterintuitive conclusion of suffocation in a high oxygen environment. It's at that point that most journalists simply stop reading the paper, even though in the following 20 pages it describes exactly why this isn't a problem. So, the MIT students consider two possible scenarios to solve the 68 days problem. The first one is that no food is produced locally on Mars, and instead it is shipped from Earth every 26 months. In the second possible solution, all of the food is grown locally on Mars, but this time the in-situ resource utilisation system is enabled. I'm going to focus on the second possibility, since that corresponds most closely with Mars One's plans. But I'll require two key assumptions. The first one is that the plants need to be in a separate compartment in order to decouple their oxygen production from the rest of the habitat. And the second one is that an oxygen removal assembly is required in order to transfer the excess oxygen produced by the plants into the oxygen storage tanks. And this oxygen removal assembly is a technology that is very well documented here on Earth. It does, of course, require more testing before we send people to Mars, but it's by no means new technology. So what are the conclusions when local resource production is taken into account? Well, see for yourself. Here is the oxygen in the storage tanks as a function of time on the left, which dips slightly whilst the first plants are growing, but then stabilises.
And here on the right is the nitrogen in the storage tanks, which declines slowly over 400 days due to leakage to the surrounding environment, but it never entirely depletes. And after around 800 days, the second crew arrives, bringing more supplies and spare parts to replace those lost, and no fatalities need occur whatsoever. A pretty boring conclusion, and hence why it hasn't been reported, but don't take my word for it. I encourage you to read the report yourself. You'll find the things I'm referencing around page 12 or so. You can check it out here or down below. The MIT researchers also find that the in-situ resource utilisation system produces 12 and a half times its mass in supplies over a two-year period, which justifies producing the supplies locally instead of just shipping everything from Earth. But there is one big drawback, though, which is that the amount of spare parts required to maintain the local resource production system causes the mission to cost more than if the supplies were simply shipped from Earth every 26 months. Of course, this is based on an extremely large number of assumptions the MIT team had to make to carry out the analysis, but for the most part, their assumptions are relatively reasonable and based on extrapolations of existing technologies. But this naturally leads to large error margins and uncertainties in their conclusions, which will become clearer after testing of the simulation bases here on Earth. A particularly elegant solution to the spare part problem is to make use of local manufacturing using technologies such as 3D printers, which are currently being tested on the International Space Station. This would most likely dramatically cut the cost of the mission relative to sending manufactured spare parts and has the added advantage of extra redundancy should a resupply shipment fail for whatever reason. The MIT researchers have even offered to redo their analysis taking this into account and will shortly make their simulation software publicly available so that anyone can experiment with the parameters. As despite what you might have heard, they want to ensure that the human missions to Mars are successful, and this paper is an excellent step towards achieving that goal. So to conclude, are the Mars One colonists going to die after 68 days? Only if you don't fully enable the life support system.